Dear Senator, dear President, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I would like to take you tonight on a journey, on a long journey that starts sometime in the Middle Ages, but don't worry, we will, it will not take that long to describe it, but it will increase its speed exponentially to come to the present times in order to understand so some of the issues that President Lenzen just discussed in his, uh, in his address, and also perhaps look at the societal conditions and at the evolution in our understanding of what a university is in order to uh, define its role within society. In early 2016, after having served about 10 years as president of the University of Basel in Switzerland, I spent a sabbatical at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. At that time, the university leadership was facing a resurgence of the roads must fall movement that the year before had led to the removal of the statue of the university's benefactor, Cecil Rhodes, which was located in visible position in the center of the UCT campus. Within my own academic culture, forged as it is by Max Weber's separation between science and politics, I interpreted these events, the events I was observing around me, as a blatant example of political pressure on the university. But was that really the case? Or was much more the university, which also contributes actively to the societal context in which it is embedded, reactive in a constructive way to the legitimate concerns of its main constituency. At the same time, my home university in Switzerland was experiencing a debate which, while certainly less momentous than the, at the global level than the distribution of educational changes in South Africa, was not free of interesting institutional implications. One of its two Träger, the cantons that legally own the university and appoint its governing board, announced that financial reasons compelled it to reduce its contribution to the university's budget in the next funding period, and at the same time prompted the university leadership to align its strategy with the government's expectations, for example, by consolidating what it considered too broad an academic portfolio. The university community interpreted this decision unanimously as an illegitimate political intervention, and university leaders reminded the state that the advantages, including economic advantages, brought about by the university outweigh by far the state's contribution to the university's budget. But was this political intervention by the canton genuinely inappropriate? Should it not be accepted that a democratically elected state government prioritize its expenditures within the boundaries of the expected tax revenues and its electorate's mandate? These two arbitrarily chosen episodes shed light, in my opinion, on the variety of ways in which we can look at the university from historical and institutional perspectives and assess the appropriateness of the ties with the political sphere. In the first instance, the issue at stake concerned the social setting of the university. Is the university an institution, that is, an educational structure with a certain degree of permanence that transcends individual lives and intentions, or an organization, that is, an educational structure that pursues collective goals and whose success is primarily determined by its stakeholders' satisfaction. In the second instance, we were dealing with an issue of governance. Do we view the university as an association governed by its members, faculty and students, or as a company governed by its sh shareholders, state funding agencies? So, how political should universities be? The answer will necessarily be a flexible one and depend on what I would call the university's social contract. That is the dynamic position the academic institution has come to occupy in the society in which it is embedded. 
Through the 18th century, European universities were sites for the propagation of professorial knowledge, formally founded by the church, but mostly funded by the local rulers or elites. They were politically legitimated and, I would say provocatively, therefore, institutionally autonomous establishments. They were autonomous entities because they also had jurisdictional power. And for very good reasons, they emphasized teaching and in all branches of knowledge, hence the expression universitas studiorum, utilitarian ties to the professorial status and to the professional elite were in the foreground. In the 17th and in the 18th century then, the Enlightenment contributed to the end of this medieval type of university, which after the Reformation had become rather confessional, both in the Protestant and in the Catholic world, and rather saw in a new type of institution, variously called academy or learned society, the best place for the development of the new science, as Gian Battista Vico would have called it. Then, in the 19th century, three comparable but culturally very different university reform movements established themselves in the Western world and shaped our understanding of the social function of this institution down to the end of the 20th century. They were the German Humboldt model, the Anglo-Saxon liberal arts education, and the French Grand École. Humboldt's educational knowledge privileged disciplinary contents, Wissenschaft, and viewed education as a transmission of a disciplinary perspective, Fach in German, to students as future academics. The Anglo-Saxon model, uh, so especially as it developed under the influential writings of John Henry Newman, proceeded from a wider canon uh, of cultural contents that when absorbed by students would generate in them good citizenship and prepare them for elite functions in society. The post-Napoleonian uh, Grande École, on the other hand, aimed at preparing the most gifted young people for the state service through a curriculum based on engineering sciences. While none of these models had a specific political vocation and indeed recognized in different ways the independence of knowledge from power, it is not difficult to realize if we reject a naive understanding of what constitutes academic freedom, that two of these reforms were very much rooted in a specific political, state-based reading of the function of higher education. The least political, while at the same time the most culturally self-conscious of the three models was certainly the Anglo-Saxon Liberal Arts College, which viewed higher education in the light of society's common good. Over the last 25 years, universities worldwide, particularly in Europe, but worldwide, have undergone profound changes, leading to a global renegotiation of university culture at the crossroads of global politics and local policies. In Europe, as the result of the Sorbonne and Bologna declarations, universities adopted the curricular architecture of the Anglo-Saxon bachelor-master sequence, but without adapting the contents of university education to the, new, to the new architecture. All in all, continental European universities were happy with the existing educational model and developed, in fact, various forms of passive resistance prompting an interesting dichotomy between, on the one hand, a political culture that for years kept stressing the advantages of the Bologna reform without truly understanding it, and on the other hand, an academic culture echoing Penelope's pretension to be weaving a shroud during daytime only to undo it at night. We kept declaring that the goals of the reform had been successfully reached, which was only true from a formal point of view, while circumventing, if not downright rejecting, its principles in daily academic life. No lecture of an Egyptologist without pyramids. So uh, as a result, 
university education has remained fundamentally disciplinary and consecutive, that is, without substantial vertical mobility after the bachelor's degree, and the master's degree has maintained its status as prototypical academic achievement. During the same time span, the Anglo-Saxon system has gone global and has been adopted by the emerging academic powers, especially in Asia. So the reason of the pyramid, the recourse to the pyramid, is that, as you know, there are two types of pyramid. One type of pyramid, the Egyptian one, the true correct one, of course, where the pyramid is just a heap of stones not meant to be, to be climbed upon and being powerful by quantity, as it were. And the other one, the Aztec, type of pyramid which is meant as a stairway where you actually, which you had to climb and go to the up in order to perform all these horrible things like getting hearts out of people and etc. So, while the terminology and formal architecture of university education have merged worldwide, the old licenses, magisters and diplomas having been superseded by bachelors and masters, the cultural divide as we were reminded by President Lenzen, in terms of values, citizenship versus Wissenschaft, and of access by selection versus by entitlement, has been maintained and is indeed a distinctive feature of the continental European as opposed to the global academic landscape. This cultural divide has consequences in terms of the political position of the university. In the Anglo-American and now global university culture, it is uncontroversial that students' admission should be guided by the principle of selectivity, which is conceptually coupled with the idea that education is an investment justifying high tuition fees, and that the quality of a university is, to a certain extent, contingent on or measurable by the quality of the student body it is able to attract. By contrast, continental European and post-colonial African universities maintain a consensus, which in Europe goes back to the emergence of the new left and the 68 events, and in Africa to the national liberation movements, that higher education is a right, and that therefore tuition fees should be low, or in the fundamental German, fundamentalist German interpretation, even inexistent. In this reading, higher education is a political right, ideally to be exercised with as little selection as possible. Let us represent this functional opposition as a quadrant in which the values upheld by the university and the access to it generate four prototypical types of university. In the model of access based on selection, the student relates to the institution of higher education on the basis of a private contract, which makes the university the student's immediate socio-political referent. At Harvard, students recently protested against a particular candidate for a college dean's position on the basis of a political reading of the candidate's professional commitments which we may very well attribute to political correctness, but which is understandable which, within this logic in view of the fact that the college dean position is indeed a community-based, not strictly speaking, an academic appointment. On the contrary, in the case of access based on entitlement, for example, by virtue of having obtained a high school diploma, the relationship between a student in the university is regulated by public law, not by a contract, but by law, which places the institution and its members on a par as equal object of political decisions. In Baden-Württemberg, I chair an advisory board established by the Minister of Science to monitor the implementation of very minimal differential student fees for non-EU students. On this board, Universities are represented together with state officials, community leaders, church and student organizations. And so far, I have not sensed any institutionally based distinction, university versus students, on the positions that are being negotiated. 
Such an asymmetry in the relationship between students and institutions has two important consequences. First, universities that can select their students in the way Anglo-American or Asian universities do operate in a global education market based on the dialectics of supply and demand, which is guided far more by the market's invisible hand than the classical European universities that do not have selective admissions. Second, in the Anglo-American approach, more value is attached to the quality of teaching, for example, through the existence of teaching colleges, whereas in the continental European approach, the turn to institutional excellence has come to be almost exclusively identified with research achievements. When trying to answer the question on how political universities should be, therefore, we should not forget that the cultural semantics of the terms involved has yielded very different semantic meetings, meanings uh, of the term university. In English, the adjective political does not have the same connotations as politik in French or politisch in German. And the encompassing concept of university is located somewhere in the middle between the French université, which has had for two centuries to fight for its status in a society in which another institution of higher education, the Grande École, enjoyed socioeconomic prominence, and the German Universität, which is the other extreme, which has established its cultural, scientific, and professional supremacy in a regime of monopoly. We now turn to the political perspective of the, on the university that I call institutional and that concerns the mission. What does that particular university stand for and the governance of the university? Who are the owners of the academic project? In the Anglo-Saxon model, the local here, the entrance to the to Berkeley, University of Berkeley, the ideal university is a campus which sees itself as a city, as a location of institutional identity and community building, whereas in continental Europe, here, your own university, uh, that, uh, so as a location, so, right, uh, in Europe, the model of the university in the city prevails. Anglo-American institutions, whether public or private, engage in political discourse and meet with decision makers as potentially equal partners, whereas continental European universities, because of their politically founded uh, historical origin, as well as their almost exclusive dependence on state funding, tend to view themselves as objects of political discourse. This is why a president of Harvard is much more likely to be pushed out of office for political reasons, political in the Aristotelian sense, as was the case with Larry Summers in 2006, than a politically incorrect president of a European university, in whose case one would immediately suspect illegitimate political intervention and the ad adjective political would be interpreted in its governmental sense. As long as the prevailing political culture is inspired by the values of enlightenment and liberalism, as in the free Hanseatic city of Hamburg, academia operates on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean in what is viewed as a kind of autonomy from political influence. But when politics turn from liberalism to populism, things change in both academic cultures, as one can easily see in the case of the fate of the humanities in the US or of gender studies in Hungary. If you try once again to represent the binary institutional setting of a university in the form of a quadrant, we might want to juxtapose the axis of mission, which goes from a focus on education to a focus on the impact of education, and the axis of governance, which determines whether the university relies more heavily on its stakeholders' regulations or on the sense of ownership developed by the academic community. The institutional locus somewhere on this quadrant, filled here with four prototypical examples, and 
these are prototypical, but of course all our universities are all somewhere in this uh, uh, quadrant and position themselves politically uh, in uh, more or less different intersections. The in institutional locus somewhere also determines the amount of political influence and political correctness to which the university and its leadership are exposed. A university under strong stakeholders' control, regardless of the difference between public or private Trägerschaft, which seems to me relatively uh, of have, of having, uh, to have relatively little impact on the university's mission and governance, who expect to have a, a saying in defining academic policies and more oriented toward the translational engagement, will necessarily have to act in a politically more conscious manner than the rectorate of a classical post-68 German Gremien Universität, which will rather concentrate on mediating between different centers of academic power and of academic excellence. This applies all the more so to a liberal arts American college, such as the College of William and Mary, where undergraduate students can design their own individual curriculum. But even the focus uh, on an educational rather than translational mission does not free the university from the need to respond dialectically to political decisions. To understand this, let us take a closer look, look at the recent history of European higher education. At the beginning of the 21st century, in the wake of the Bologna reform, European universities decided more or less spontaneously to devote special attention to educational issues, and particularly to the domain of teaching. This was the time of the creation of the European higher education area, of the development of joint degrees, and of the support of large-scale student mobility, for example, through the Erasmus program. The focus on teaching was paired by an institutional stress on the narrative of autonomy, which was prompted by the fact that at the same time, European universities were universally emancipating themselves from tight political control and experiencing a shift toward the consolidation of academic decisions in the hands of a stronger central leadership. This is indeed a form of autonomy, however one with a particular semantic reading of this word, which does not include, for example, the privilege to choose between different sources of income. The financial backbone of European universities remained predominantly, and in many cases solely, uh, the uh, state, the public hand, and its funding basically came without strings attached. What kind of autonomy can you truly aspire to in view of financial dependence? We shall return to this issue in a moment. Over the last 10 years, however, a dramatic change has taken place which has increased the number of strings attached to the university's public funding. The traditional logic of co-optation, which saw academic institutions linked by a sort of common understanding of academic prestige and inter-institutional solidarity, has been gradually replaced by the logic of competition in which the university's performance becomes measurable and other universities may be indeed viewed as potential partners, but alas, also as potential rivals. The necessity to provide empirical indicators of the university's performance has pulled research ever closer to the center of attention of both university leaders and political actors. Based on the increased power of the rankings, uh, and despite regular questioning of their actual information content, an orientation around scientific excellence has established itself through government programs in countries as diverse as Germany, France, or Japan. This has given yet another competitive advantage to the model of the globalized uh, world-class university. Let us now turn uh, once again to the quadrant we saw before 
and more particularly to the translational side of the axis of the university's mission. What does the term political mean in this case? A university with strong collaborations with private industry will necessarily have to respond to the political expectation that it should uh, contribute to local economy in countries as diverse as China and Switzerland, in spite of the objective differences in their political culture, much more so than uh, that one that shares research facilities teams with the Max Planck Institute or benefits from a large philanthropic endowment. In terms of the university's mission, political pressures on the universities to adapt its curricular offerings to socioeconomic priorities may therefore prove more useful than benign political neglect, as shown by the qualitative leap of the Chinese universities, as opposed to the ever-shrinking number of public colleges in the US. Uh, a third aspect in which the answer to the issue of the legitimacy of politics in the university requires a differentiated answer concerns university typology. Over the last 20 years, the global academic landscape has experienced a transition process that Max Weber would have called a Vergesellschaftung, an institutional transformation from an endogenous, community-based Gemeinschaft to an exogenous, stakeholder-based understanding of the role of universities. Processes and decisions that used to be only rooted within the academic community have uh, gradually acquired social relevance and visibility. Universities worldwide have become more autonomous in their academic and administrative decisions, but also connectedly with this uh, evolution, more exposed to institutional scrutiny by their respective governing bodies, whether private or public. In those cases, particularly in the European academic culture, in which identity and sense of ownership were mainly derived from the field of study, I derive my professional pride, first of all, by being, from being an Egyptologist. University autonomy has led to a shift to an institutional sense of ownership. I derive my professional pride, first of all, from being a faculty member of the University of Basel, as displayed by the pin that I wear tonight. This was usual in the Anglo-Saxon educational systems, but in Europe, before this cultural turn, it only applied to institutions with a strong ideological or professional identity, such as, for example, the Catholic University of Fribourg or the technical ETH in Switzerland. Finally, the inevitable but universally disliked price tag of institutional autonomy is that university needs to develop controlling, accounting, facilities, logistics, marketing, reporting, much more extensively than the old conglomerate of sometimes small size institutes of the past. After universities, in the wake of the Bologna reform, focused on teaching and competencies and later shifted, as we saw, their institutional attention to research and excellence, in very, very, very recent years, say the last three to five years, a new paradigm has established itself as a motor of university development, the paradigm of innovation. Until 20 years ago, any use of the term innovation in my own country, in Switzerland, would have provoked horror in the context of university. Not only it would have been used, it would have provoked horror. It is difficult now to find a EUA report, a governmental program, or a third-party funded project which does not consider innovation, whether it's in its narrower economic sense or in its broader social sense, a substantial part of the university's third mission, what makes this shift even more powerful is the fact that both endogenous and exogenous factors now prompt the university to assume a leading role in the regional ecosystem. Local economy through knowledge transfer and global science through the trend to interdisciplinarity and global challenges, both factors having contributed to add 
innovation to the universities, to original missions, teaching and research. The path to a renegotiation of the university's social contrast thus becomes clear. The expansion of the university's core functions generates attention to new forms of societal leadership, less focused on the traditional type of knowledge and more on the develop development of entrepreneurial skills among students and faculty. In this sense, we are indeed experiencing now a momentous transformation of the university, which reminds one of the epochal changes that took place with the transformation from the medieval to the modern university in the 19th century. But the focus of innovation, on innovation is, of course, a child of economic and scientific globalization. It is indeed a political focus, precisely in that it stresses the university's economic ties. The first move in this direction took place in the 90s uh, of the past century and led not only in the German-speaking world to institutional changes in the higher education landscape, such as the establishment of the Universities of Applied Sciences, Fachhochschulen, in the German-speaking world, or similar move, the abolishment of the distinction between universities and polytechnics in the UK in pretty much the same period in 1992. But as we observed, the strategies of the classical universities in the first decade of the 21st century turned to competitive research and scientific excellence, and the classical universities, such as mine, were encyclopedically forced to adopt let's call it the Harvard, Oxford, world-class university, as the ideal paradigm of university quality. The success of the rankings conferred supplementary prestige to this shift uh, of the university's second mission. Whether we attribute contents, powerful uh, contents, informational contents to the rankings or not is secondary. Finally, the current innovation turn has made a third particular type of university, the technical university, such as the ETH, or even better, the EPFL in Switzerland, or the Technische Universität München, which combines research excellence and societal impact, the politically most sought after model of higher education to elicit support, much in the vein of the success of the Pasteur quadrant in the development of application-oriented basic research. Basic research, applied research, application-oriented basic research, the best of all possible worlds. Right. This also corresponds to the strategy now followed by European science policymakers for the next years. One we need only think of the focus that the future framework program Horizon Europe seems to lay on mission-based mission -based research, or perhaps also, but this may be pure coincidence, of the fact that the scientists chosen as the, the mathematician Jean-Pierre Bourguignon's successor as ERC president at the helm of European research is an American medical nanotechnologist. So, uh, the university's th third mission, therefore, neither came out of the blue nor responded to university internal pressures, but rather clearly dovetails on the political desire to uh, intensify the collaboration between the institutions of higher education and the main source of research funding in Europe, which is, of course, the private sector, especially the industry, pharma, biotech, green tech, artificial intelligence, and so on. In Germany or Switzerland, between two-thirds and three-fourths of the money invested in RTD is of corporate origin. And in view of limited funding, it is of crucial importance for universities that can afford investment in expensive, investment in expensive research fields such as life sciences or computer sciences, to orientate their strategy uh, toward increasing corporate partnerships. 
Whenever the news of yet another research chair in collaboration with an uh, industry is published, the university stresses, usually sincerely, that this new chair perfectly fits the university's long-standing strategy. But why does it rarely happen that the university rejects a collaboration because it does not fit its strategy? Because the university, in this case, is being political in its own interest and perhaps also in the interest of research. Furthermore, it must be kept in mind that the state, as it appears in the current university context, in post-industrial societies, is not any longer an inflexible bureaucratic machinery, but has rather turned into what the University College London scholar Mariana Mazzucato calls the entrepreneurial state. Mazzucato has shown that we should not look at the public hand uh, in a neoliberal way, only as a hindrance, uh, but also indeed as a real source of innovation that precedes and to a large extent conditions private investments. The state is itself a factor of innovation in that it finances research programs that foster an innovation agenda. The ERC Council in Brussels, CERN in Geneva, the supersensitive telescope Meerkat in South Africa would have been unthinkable without political will and massive investments of public money. We now hear that ERC Horizon Europe should become more mission-based. Is this a political intervention? Of course it is. A uh, and what should universities say? N say, no, thank you, it infringes on our autonomy. A fundamentalist, anti-political approach, therefore, runs against the best interest of an entrepreneurial university or of a also entrepreneurial university. The critical mass of research groups in specific disciplines and the importance of research in networks benefit from state-funded research initiative, uh, thus shaping scientific progress much more effectively than if decisions were all delegated to the level of the single research groups. The gradual differentiation of the higher education sector which has taken place in Europe, therefore, has generated four types of uh, typological identities in addition, many types, in addition to the classical university model. These two institutions differ from the traditional model university, be it in their ownership or in their academic programs, in that they concentrate on specific educational needs, generally dovetailing on the expectations of the labor market. Thus, the organizational and academic autonomy is counterbalanced by an increased strategic attention to the political and economic context, since many of the university stakeholders entertain different notions of what its mission actually entails. For universities worldwide, however, the most difficult political engagement lies ahead of us. The technological and now social cultural innovation that has come to be known as the digital turn has opened up new ways of accessing knowledge that for universities bear both tremendous scientific potential and also worrying dangerous threats. Simulation. Visual representations rouse our emotions more than written texts. Learning in the digital age is always complemented by images and imagination. More than ever before, transmitted information through digital simulation blurs the boundaries of scientific visualization, literary fiction, and, as we have to recognize, also intentional fraud. Simulations have pushed our analog access to knowledge to the margins. They offer a challenge to the existing rules of information, art, and science, because the essence of simulation is not to reproduce a historical, social, or scientific reality, but rather to visualize the connections between fragments of information. And it is precisely in this cognitive shift that lies the potential contact 
between simulation and the post-factual. As scientific communities, in view of the, generalized, of the generalized loss of trust, if not in scientific evidence per se, at least in the relevance of its representatives in the socio-political debate, universities should develop a fourth mission which consists in offering trustworthy orientation to society in dealing with the scientific advantages, but also of the cognitive, with the cognitive dangers of digitally transmitted information. This is an eminently political function that universities should embrace with both hands. But is it truly knowledge that, it, that is becoming more visual, more social, and more accessible through digitalization? Or is it just information? If fragments of information need to be consolidated into real knowledge, then communicating them alone is not enough. Above, above all, information fragments need to be amalgamated and bundled. When not embedded into an adequate context, an encyclopedia, as semioticians would call it, digitally transmitted fragments of information lose their potentially authoritative power and can be easily manipulated, as again we see daily. Digital knowledge is readily accessible, but only in an undisciplined form. Therefore, before, between knowledge and fake news, there has to be uh, the, the, the boundary between knowledge and fake news has to be monitored very carefully, and universities should take it upon themselves to discipline this process. But how can we differentiate between disciplined knowledge and undisciplined fragments of information? By applying critical reason, the enlightenment that President Lenzen mentioned. For universities worldwide, the most dangerous exposure to political manipulation does not come from direct governmental restrictions or economic pressures, although, of course, as we see also daily, there are many instances, even in this continent, where it indeed does happen, but it rather comes under the disguise of populist simplifications of scientific challenges. This is where I see the great potential of a fourth mission of the university, which transcends its present or past, or present past narrative of autonomy. Thus, the answer to the question I was asked to discuss cannot be univocal, but is unavoidably rooted in the cultural, institutional, and economic reality in which each university is embedded. How political should universities be? It depends on the unwritten social contract that ties together university and society. Within this social contract, the university should be as political as it takes in order to successfully fulfill its societal mission and implement its strategic goals. And it should remain as unpolitical as it can in order to maintain its institutional autonomy and secure its academic community's sense of ownership. But above all, the university should be as politically engaged as it takes to provide leadership in sustaining the values of the Enlightenment in the age of simulation. Thank you very much.